All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's 11.30. It's time to start with this uh, parallel session. Uh, welcome to everyone. Very happy that you are all here for this session regarding the cooperation between BMW and the city of Rotterdam. Uh, let me just start out by this fact. Um, it is expected that in 2030, 60% of the world's population will live in a big city. And that means that cities will have a big influence in the future of mobility, not just in the way we travel and commute within a city, but within the broader regions, they will influence the way people commute over there as well. And that's why it's worth taking a look at what the city of Rotterdam has done in cooperation with BMW to really um, look into the future of mobility of a big city. Because these are, you could say, two very unlikely partners. Uh, usually there tends to be a little bit of an antagonistic relationship between car manufacturers on one hand and big cities on the other hand. Uh, but you see here a very successful cooperation that is based on the fact that both have unique insights that they contribute to solving a shared problem and uh, that is why they've worked together. BMW on the one hand is more than a car manufacturer. They work on things like energy charging and energy services. They work on data, urban, uh, urban data collection, all kinds of things. They really know the target group of car owners very, very well. And on the other hand, you have the city of Rotterdam. They obviously want a very attractive city, a city that is clean, that is healthy, but that is also accessible and they are confronted with the fact that there's an energy transition going on and they want to take a leadership role in that. And therefore, these two parties, they have come together and they have decided to join forces. And today we're going to talk about what they've learned from each other, how that uh, partnership has come to be and how they see the future of mobility in a big city such as Rotterdam, but certainly not just Rotterdam. We're going to look into the future and see what perhaps your city, wherever you are coming to us from, uh, can possibly look like. And we're going to be doing that with uh, several speakers here today. We have several guests. We're going to have a discussion with all of those guests. Uh, we have a couple of speakers uh, uh, from the city of Rotterdam. We have Martin Goud here. He is from uh, the city of Rotterdam. He's a strategic advisor for the Department of Mobility. We also have Bas van Koper. He is the strategic advisor for the Department of Economic Affairs. Then we have from BMW in Munich, Germany, uh, Thomas Becker. He's the head of urban mobility and projects and intelligence. And we have, uh, excuse me, the, the head of sustainability and mobility. And we have uh, Monica Dernay. She's the head of urban mobility projects and intelligence. And finally, the CEO of BMW in the Netherlands, that is Stephanie Wurst. Uh, Stephanie, you are usually based in the Netherlands, but this time you are coming to us from Munich. Uh, I just want to check to be sure, did you drive or did you fly to Munich from uh, the Netherlands? Um, I drove to Munich because I work in a car company. <laughs> okay. I was going to expect that answer. Very good. With our um, <laughs> very sustainably produced products. But I don't think we are that far in the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. We'll get to that. And just to be clear, uh, Stephanie and uh, Thomas and uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, let me see if we can see him. Uh, but Monica, uh, you guys are supposed to be in the same room. We can't yes. see Monica yet, uh, but they are in the same room. So uh, it might be jarring if we learn that later on. So I'm saying it up front. You guys are sitting pretty much next to each other. All right. Those are the speakers. Uh, some housekeeping details that we should probably also mention. Uh, we would very much encourage you uh, to participate because interactivity makes this more interesting, more engaging. There are a couple of ways you can do so. Uh, you can see them on the screen. You can, of course, participate in the chat to talk with other participants about some of the things that speakers are perhaps saying. Uh, we are going to ask you a couple of questions. We're going to ask you your opinion at a certain point during the session. And in the polls tab on the right side of your screen, you can actually answer those questions that we have for you. And of course, you can also pose questions to the speakers. In fact, we encourage you to ask as many questions as you'd like to the speakers. At the end of the session, we have uh, a dedicated amount of time to focus on actually getting all your questions uh, answered, or at least as many as possible answered. So there's more than enough time for that. Uh, do contribute your questions whenever they pop into your head, and I will pose those questions to the various speakers. Of course, you can also uh, contribute and participate in the event afterwards, and you can do that uh, by um, uh, uh, looking and rereading the chat, looking at the polls, the people, the Q&A tabs, and of course, this session is recorded for future reference. All right. Um, 
having said all of that, uh, those are all the housekeeping and administrative things that need to be taken care of, um, that has been taken care of. Let's start with the discussion and let's start with the meat of the matter, first of all. Uh, let, let me just go to the background first, because I think it sort of is good to get sort of an idea of why this uh, uh, agreement came to be, how did it uh, come to be. Uh, um, it, it is not a very, uh, uh, something you see very often, so I'm very curious to see how this came about. And let me start with you, uh, Bas, you are from the city of Rotterdam. Uh, can you tell us something about why you guys were considering a collaboration with BMW? Yeah, I, I really love to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, well, to, to, to start this answer, to, this, to answer this question, i like to give you a little bit more background of our economic approach we have in the city. Uh, and as a city, we um, are embracing the next economy. And the next economy is, is a future economy, which is based on the transition by three pillars. The energy transition, you mentioned already before, but also on digitalization and about the circular economy. And, um, we don't know really much about this future because we know this this future will be disruptive this will be uh, new and not like the old way we are looking for this future uh, but every day we learn and learn and learn and we know right now that this will be uh, a future where the, the the next steps will be disruptive we don't know when it happens we don't know how it happens we don't know it's in which order these three pillars will or will uh, evolve uh, so we have to adapt a certain kind of new way to to live with it and to be ready for this future or not only for the for a very beautiful city to live and work in but also to to engage people to to for schooling for it so um therefore we need to learn and adapt quickly and a long-term collaborations are in our our opinion a really start a really good starting point to have this background of, of adaptation and learning together because you have to gain some trust to, to, to look into this unknown future and another way of, uh, 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 of what we're trying to do is, is also by innovation and uh, learning with innovation is these next steps in the future and uh, therefore uh, well you cannot innovate on your own you need to collaborate to innovate and uh, if you work with the person and the people and the partners you always used to work with, uh, then in my opinion, you get an optimization of what you've been doing and sometimes an innovation. But if you really want to innovate, you have to find these unlikely parties like you mentioned in the, in the, in the, in the introduction. And um, well, with BMW, we found such a partner because uh, if you, and Marky will elaborate more on this later on, has this goal as a city to reduce the amount of cars in the city, uh, why should you work with a many car manufacturer? And that's when this discussion started, this collaboration started, we learned so much more about each other. And then we found out, like you mentioned, that we the BMW is just a car manufacturer. It has more and more and more knowledge and, and, and future uh, visions of a future. That's why we found each other. And that's why we think these kind of collaborations will help us definitely to, to take a couple of next steps into the future and hopefully answer some questions about this uh, new next exactly exactly and uh that's the the perspective of the city of rotterdam uh let's take a look at the perspective from the bmw group uh thomas um uh, why is a car manufacturer such as bmw working with a uh, city like rotterdam what's in it for you guys well for us uh, times are changing massively at the moment and if you look at the past, what did sustainability mean for a car company? It meant to produce in a sustainable manner in the plants we own. And it meant reducing emissions at the tailpipe of our cars and introducing safety features at a technical level that would reduce the risks of uh, fatalities, accidents, etc. That was basically it. And on the other hand, we had transport policies, we had transport management, uh, which operated with tools which have been established over 100 years. And now several things are happening at the same time. First of all, we have a sustainability agenda, which is not anymore about improving a technology that is there, but about changing fundamentally the drivetrain. So we are moving into electrification. Uh, that means that, for example, and this is one of the pillars of our uh, new sustainability strategy, we need to look much deeper into our supply chains, for example, looking into the effect 
that the production, for example, of batteries has on the environment in order to be able to demonstrate to all our customers they are making a good choice and reliably so. So that is one aspect. But the other side of the coin is that the usage side is changing. And here we are seeing the challenge to much better connect uh, the infrastructure, the electricity sector uh, with the management of our vehicles. And all of that in an environment where we see totally new digital options of managing the car and managing the city. And this is why we need to overcome the separation of these two spheres, because the tools we will have at hand allow us to connect them and thereby to become much more effective and efficient in reducing the burden of congestion, of emissions, and the impact on climate. And just one example of how that all comes down to our customers. Um, I'm living in the outskirts of Munich. And as a standard feature, my car, a plug-in hybrid, would offer me uh, to switch right at the main road that is uh, outside of this building here to go into the electric mode in order to maximize the benefit uh, of the combination of a combustion and an electric drivetrain and maximize the use of the electric drivetrain uh, in the usage of that car. And this is an innovation that was done and developed in Rotterdam with Rotterdam uh, hmm. by our colleagues in the Netherlands. So, and this is now available wherever we sell those products. And that's, I think, a very tangible example how we think that collaboration can bear fruit and be beneficial for both. That's actually fascinating. So essentially the car knows where it is based on GPS coordinates and then it gives a signal to the driver. It's you're approaching a big city. It's time to switch over to the electric uh, uh, battery and then the driver basically has to press a button and that encourages more people to drive electrically in a big city. Exactly. It's even more easy, actually. It, it um, switches over automatically. You don't even have to drive, um, push a button because it's the default mode. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that means obviously for people who are living in a big city, that means that you simply have uh, less air pollution. So it's a lot cleaner. It's a lot less noisier, for example. So a lot of benefits for people living in cities. Yeah, and clearly the other side of the coin is that on all those topics we used to deal with in the past, it was national lab regulators or even supranational organizations which defined the rule of the game for the automotive industry. Hmm. But if you look at the question, what motivates people to actually drive an electric vehicle? What will motivate or demotivate them to drive more or less sustainable? The level where the basic decisions are taken is moving downwards to regions and cities. And therefore, I think we will have to have also a new, let's say, uh, regulation, a new management model in Europe between the European, the national and the city level which will evolve over the years. And in order to be part of that story, we want to work with the most competent people uh, in the most advanced places. And Rotterdam clearly is, is one of those. Exactly. Um, uh, Stephanie, can you talk about how the parties uh, found each other? Uh, we've talked about it a couple of times. Uh, it's an unlikely uh, partnership. Uh, can you tell us about the history? How did this partnership come to be? Always love to talk about the Netherlands and about Rotterdam. Um, actually, it was um, a local connection from one of our dealers um, in, um, in the Rotterdam area who reached out to the city. So our dealers are very much integrated in local societies and there were connections. And then we took it um, in our national sales company and then decided to lift it on an international level from there because we found there's a lot of benefit uh, for all of us in um, this connection. Then we came to the first project, which was this electric city drive, which I love, only, not only because it was developed in the Netherlands, but um, it's really, uh, it, it really reduces CO2 where it matters most in the, in the inner cities. And in the meantime, we have rolled it out um, to five other cities in the Netherlands, but of course Rotterdam was the first and a lot of um, other cities in Europe and also in Germany. And uh, it took a little while, and then we signed a so um, called MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding. That was in September 2018, and that was the moment I arrived in the Netherlands, which was nice as well. So it started uh, at the same time. And it's a, a longer process and a longer commitment to develop um, what I think groundbreaking pro um, uh, projects together that make life in the city uh, or make the collaboration of, uh, of inner city traffic and cars um, more beneficial for everyone. And I love that it's um, that it doesn't happen on a PowerPoint slide, but it's actually happening in the city and we can measure 
clients, but also a broader public can participate in that. And we see results in that um, in that pilot mentioned. Um, we found that even when it was not default mode, that 96% um, of the people just switched um, voluntarily in that mode because there was a gaming feature in it. And I love that it's not about uh, it's not about bans, but it's about um, triggering the gaming instinct of people and making it um, it making it fun to contribute to uh, reducing CO2. And how does that gaming aspect work? Because I think you, you get a certain amount of points if you use the right. electric battery. And you can redeem the points. First of all, it's an aspect of competition in all of us, I think, um, that you don't want to be last in, in the list. And uh, you can gain points and you can redeem the points in uh, in charging. For example. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, this is actually interesting. I think what, what you're describing too is just sort of not just sort of talking about it, but getting it done. And that's something that obviously fits with the city of Rotterdam because it's a city that uh, in the Netherlands is known for getting things done. While in other cities they do a lot of talking. Uh, usually it is said that in Amsterdam the money is spent and in Rotterdam the money is earned. I'm not saying that's entirely true. There might be people who would take offense to that, but that is at least a reputation that the city has. Making uh, it happen, right? <laughs> excuse me. Making it happen, that's what Rotterdam says. Exactly, exactly. That's what they feel like. Boss, if, 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 was there any um, uh, pushback within uh, your colleagues or City Hall to this deal? How was this received when this memorandum, memorandum of understanding was signed? Well, it's, it's obviously, uh, you have to explain a lot of times that, that you're working with this, this, this unlikely partner, like you've said, and that there is much more involved. But to be honest, the the the... the the MOU, signing the MOU was, was the end of, of a very important phase in this collaboration because the, the, the real work is being done in the one, one and a half year before this signing of the MOU. And that's where you uh, talk to each other, elaborate on each other, uh, find each other, where can you reach out to each other, where does it work, where doesn't where doesn't it work. So uh, obviously in, in that time you take a lot of people in, in your own organization with you in this, uh, in this, in this, in this, this process. But yeah. still, uh, people are uh, are surprised by if you you tell them about this this collaboration and if you tell them a little bit more about the background and, and more and more inside depth, then it became interesting. Then say people, hey, this this is quite interesting. This is this is very unique to have this this collaboration and these insights in in each other's uh, offices because that's that's one of our more main values i guess we we are having together is that we're not only doing projects which which reach goals outside like the electric city drive but we also have this 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 uh this this kind of uh collaboration where you where you share information and get get a deeper insight into each other's uh life and that's that's very important for us to know to react and to respond to the to the future as well so we do not make policy which is not uh, um, which not is not makeable. We, we like to make it happen, but it still needs to be done by other people than just uh, the, the city who makes a, a policy. So yeah. The, yeah. the output there is, is very important, and that's that's something. Yeah, you still have to, to talk about it, and you still have to explain about it because the city is not a very small city. So we have a lot of people working in the city, but yeah, yeah people are surprised and anxious. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, uh, Tom's. This is a cooperation between BMW and Rotterdam. Uh, does BMW have uh, a similar uh, cooperation with other cities? Yeah, we are seeking to engage with uh, cities in the main regions. Um, so, for example, there's obviously the close collaboration we are having with our hometown here in Munich, uh, which will also be the host of the International Motor Show, formerly known as the Frankfurt Motor Show. Um, then uh, we are heavily engaged uh, in discussions with uh, the municipality of Beijing uh, because uh, also there you have uh, a very ambitious uh, uh, sustainability agenda, uh, but also a very high speed of development of new technological approaches. And uh, uh, the other place uh, where we uh, do things is uh, in Los Angeles, uh, which is by far our biggest market in the United States uh, as a city. Uh, which is uh, obviously also at the core of the technology conversation, uh, but where everything from the culture of mobility uh, to the usage pattern of our own products, uh, things are very different again from how somebody in Beijing or in Rotterdam or in Munich uh, will use our products. So what we seek is to maximize the learnings we can generate uh, in these different places, understand uh, the contribution that different tools can play under very different conditions, 
uh, and uh, be engaged uh, in the policy discussions around uh, uh, those issues. Exactly. What are some of those differences between those cities you named? Well, if you take, for example, uh, a place like Munich, which is a medieval uh, princely residence, that means you have a core part of the city, which is actually Middle Ages. Um, so having a conversation, for example, about not having cars in such, a, let's say, core sector of a city is a totally different conversation to, for example, Los Angeles, which is a place that that grew and was built around mobility with cars. Yeah. So that is just one example where you see uh, huge, uh, let's say, different points when it comes to acceptance of customers, when it comes to policy options, when it comes to the impact uh, uh, on the environment. Another yeah. example is that if you look at options like car sharing and hailing, uh, data shows that uh, if you do it right, you can have uh, a positive impact uh, on the environment with the very same approach that may be the other way around under different conditions. So the data, for example, on right hailing in California shows that it may even contribute uh, to more emissions, uh, more miles driven, uh, more CO2, uh, uh, if the framework conditions uh, do not support uh, uh, a better management uh, of this solution and also uh, a mutually supportive and not adversarial relation to, for example, public transport. So a lot of things uh, are happening and we seek to keep uh, pace with it and be a driver of new technical ideas. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, Martin, I want to get you in as well because you uh, work for the Department of Mobility in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, you guys have a uh, vision for mobility in the future. Uh, what is that vision and how does this fit into it? Yes, um, thank you. Um, it's about uh, it's about changing the mindset of mobility because uh, it's very important. Uh, Rotterdam is a city built on cars as well. Uh, we we are we are a bomb city. And we have this beautiful boulevards, and that's just great. So it's a great asset. And we, but what we see the last ten years is that it's about a healthy environment, uh, uh, attractive public space, because that also means that the city is gaining much more people uh, in, in the city. And people want to live in the city, so that's why you have to clean the air, for example. That's already mentioned. Uh, all those goals uh, are very important, and that is how we uh, want to contribute with the mobility department to change that, uh, to, to change the mindset, but also to uh, uh, to, to reach those goals. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, that we can work with a big company like BMW to, uh, it's, it's, it's of course a car company, but it's a much more bigger company because it's all about different ways of mobility. Uh, it's about electric uh, car driving, but also sharing. It's about electric scooters. It's about bicycles. It's about walking. And what we did, um, uh, and our council has approved on that, is that the last five years, uh, you see a lot of amount in the heart of the city, the, the enormous growth of cyclists, it's it's really big. Uh, uh, we see a lot of growth of pedestrians, uh, and also about the public transportation, which now has a very big hit, of course, of the COVID. We, know, we all know that, but that will restore. Uh, and what we see is declining declining of the amount of car that comes into the heart of the city um and but that that that, that that's what it, what you see uh, is that it's changing so that you have to change the infrastructure with it normally i have a lot of pictures to show it uh, because i'm very proud of our new central station uh i mean it used to be a chaos of, of, of buses and trams and, and taxis and now it's a green car of a green, but also red carpet into the city. The pedestrian is king, and that's very important. So that 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 mindset is important. And of course, our new highlight is of course the our main boulevard in the heart of the city, or our council is in front of it. Uh, is the crossing where we reduce uh, the amount of car lanes from four to two. So the car is not banned out of the city, but the space of the car will reduce at several points. And there will be more space for pedestrians and cyclists, and that makes the city very attractive. So uh, what we try to, to achieve is that the car will have a place in, in, in the city, also in the future, but it should be clean. Uh, there should be less space for parking, for example, because it's, it's, it's still, uh, I think, uh, 
we should discuss about this. This it takes so much places in the streets where you can do so much other things, make it green, uh, make it playground for children. Uh, why you, and so I think shared mobility is a very uh, um, how do you say a good future for 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 a, for a city. And uh, and uh, the last point is is that it's not only about the the personal mobility from people. It's also about the logistics, and the logistics is changing now. Uh, the, the big trucks coming to the city are declining. Uh, there are cargo bikes. Uh, there, there are electric uh, ways, and will be a, a city that has a goal that says in 2030, the logistic uh, will be zero emission. So I think, I think for and that can we discuss is that all the mobility in the city of Rotterdam in the region should be zero emission in 2030. And what does it mean? How can we achieve that? And that's why it's so good that we can discuss it with, with BMW and other uh, uh, big partners, because as a city, you can never do it alone. You need uh, to cre create a collaboration, but you have to set uh, uh, very uh, clear goals so everybody can confirm to that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that is interesting. We're also going to take a look at the vision for uh, 2030 for what a city such as Rotterdam could look like when it comes to mobility. So we'll definitely get to that. Some of the things you pointed out are going to be discussed more at length. Uh, let me uh, go to this point, first of all, for this collaboration, which uh, uh, questions or problems are of interest. Uh, let me start. I'm going to ask you this as well, Mark. But I'm going to go to Thomas uh, first of all. Uh, which questions or uh, problems are of interest for this collaboration? Well, for us, the starting point is obviously the need of needs of our customers, and these are highly diverse. Uh, the same instrument may have a totally different impact on somebody who is actually living in the city environment compared to a commuter. And the vast majority of our customers in almost every market are commuters. So that means that isolated discussions, which are only looking at the city centers, uh, will not, let's say, reflect uh, the entire breadth of impact it will have. Um, so uh, this is one of the aspects where we want to really see data based from the way people use our vehicles. When do they drive? Where do they drive? Uh, where do they drive? Where do they charge? at which times of the day, uh, what are their reactions uh, to measures uh, like the ones that Martin has been, has been mentioning. And here for us, the big uh, advantage of uh, the digital toolbox we have is that we can really replace, and fastly so, uh, assumptions and beliefs uh, by facts and figures, and also share them uh, with those people uh, who are steering the system uh, at the city level. Yeah, exactly. Same maybe, question. Maybe if I can add uh, something, Victor, I think for Rotterdam, we also have a big focus on the uh, energy topic because Rotterdam is very far ahead in terms of uh, electric vehicles. So I think uh, we will see that also later in the vision picture. Um, there will be uh, some focus on electromobility as well and also uh, the electric grid. So I think there we will see a couple of the pilots that we are currently doing. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, Martin, same uh, question to you. Which uh, questions or problems of interest uh, are of interest uh, for this uh, collaboration? Uh, yeah, well, what I tried to say uh, 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 just uh, a few minutes ago is as it's very important that the city is an attractive city to live in and uh, yeah. to visit. Uh, so, that, so that means that one of the questions will be uh, how can we uh, reach that with, with this collaboration? and. And I think uh, what Thomas says is very important. Uh, uh, we, we need data uh, to convince also our council. Uh, for example, uh, ten years, I think it was five or six years ago in the heart of the city, our intersection, uh, they, were, they always said there are more cars in the morning than cyclists. But we counted and it, was, it, it had reached the point that there are more cyclists than cars in the heart of the city. So that, that convinced people so that that's also very important that we have good data and i think what monica says is important to um to to, to join the, the the energy transition because yeah. that is that that that's very good and it can be also a boost for, for new economic development and things like that so that 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 are the questions how can we achieve those goals exactly exactly and uh, stephanie uh, uh, anything you want to add to that in this sort of regard or does this cover it uh, regarding <laughs> I add the people <laughs> and uh, the customers, which are partly customers, partly people who live in the city. 
Um, and I think it's a, um, it's a huge benefit um, to um, show the um, impact of um, clean mobility, of um, emission uh, reduced mobility. And uh, we're actually working towards that in, in, as well. We are getting, uh, we're coming to a 40% electric year and more than 50% in the Netherlands next year. So these questions are of high interest to us and we are facilitating that development with, for example, products that have a much um, lower interest rates for a plug-in hybrid or for a, for a um, um, battery, fully battery, battery electric um, um, product than for a combustion engine product. So we are facilitating that in many, many ways to um, um, have a high share of um, e-mobility and that also contributes, um, I think, to, um, to this pilot and to like how, because we're asking ourselves, how would it be in the future, how would we live in the city, all this maybe, um, to come closer to these questions. That's why I'm very happy about the collaboration and that we can measure results as well. Yeah. Um, Bas and uh, Monica, uh, a question uh, for uh, the both of you. Uh, what are the challenges uh, uh, to tackle in uh, the making of this collaboration? Uh, Monica, perhaps let me start with you. Um, I think at first when you, I, I think uh, you go towards each other, everybody has the best intentions and uh, then you find out that you talk uh, totally different languages. So, for example, if the city comes and says, we want to reduce cars, obviously, as a car maker, you're like uh, suddenly scared what will happen there. Um, but then when you talk about it and you discuss what's the uh, why behind all these questions, you find out that we actually have the same interests because, because also our customers do not want to be in a traffic jam. So uh, we also want to reduce cars, uh, but we want to reduce it maybe in a different manner to the city. Uh, so discussing these topics, I think, leads us to our common goals. So we had that, and then we uh, had a huge project list. Uh, uh, maybe Bas can comment on some of those. Uh, and we also found that the energy topic is something that is uh, at heart of our both of our uh, um, interests. And then also the data topic. There are a lot of things that we were uh, discovering and uh, working towards uh, common goals, actually. Yeah, a car manufacturer that is uh, open to reducing cars. That's uh, a surprising development. I certainly did not expect, but I totally understand what you're saying. I mean, I think a lot of car owners really dislike traffic jams. So it makes cars probably less attractive. Uh, Boss, uh, uh, the same question to you. Monica already said you'll probably have a list of these things. Uh, what are some of the challenges to tackle in this collaboration? Well, I think that there, there are two uh, main challenges you have to tackle in these kind of collaborations. And the first one is obviously the, the language. Uh, uh, we, we, and it's not German versus Dutch. It's, it's, it's uh, the language between uh, the, the, the uh, really about mobility and where we, where we, where we sit. And uh, we still learn to each other about that. It's, it's still after almost three years now and I've done a half year preparation of this MOU. We've working together now quite intensely for four years. It's still uh, something we have, we have to, to figure out together. Sometimes we have different kind of, of languages. Can you give an example? Uh, is it just about the reduction of cars, for example? That's, that's the example that Monica gave. But where does your language differ? Uh, well, our language differs also in sometimes uh, in, in, in the, the way we, uh, especially in the making of this MOU about uh, the commitment from both sides. What What is commitment? Uh, how do you uh, commitment? What is the definition of commitment? In what uh, phase is this? So uh, in, in to, to tackle this, we also have invited Deloitte to help us to, to bring those two together. So we, we reached out for a little help. Yeah. But it's also in this kind of commitments from a city is, is another commitment than sometimes from, from, from a car in manufacturing. And to figure out and to combine those two, it's really challenging and really, really fun to do actually. So uh, if you really, are, both sides are open for this. And that's the other challenge you have to t tackle in this first place is to gain some trust to, to both parties that, that you are open and willing to discuss this kind of commitments because that's sometimes very scary to, to do because you have to give yourself very open uh, in this collaboration and in, in these talks and these discussions. And from day one, we uh, had a very small uh, team from, from both sides, which which worked almost outside their regular business uh, on this on this uh, collaboration. And 
by uh, getting farther and farther into uh, this collaboration, you see this, these teams are building up and, and growing. And still you have to find, but every time new people were added to the team, you still have to find a strength again. And um, at some point we were, uh, in my opinion, selling each other to each other. So uh, this is why we should work with BMW Group as a city. And in reverse also, the BMW Group city, this is why we want to work with you. And um, if you recognize that phase, then then you know you can you can switch to to another process and, and start making of a real collaboration. But that was the first phase where we at uh, uh, where we, we defined that moment uh, in in a certain kind of trust. That was the moment where we can really make the, the step up to the next phase. And that was for me one of the key issues and key moments in this collaboration in the building of this collaboration. How yeah. do we find? Is this commitment, this trust, and this this, this safe environment uh, to to talk about? So, we had a lot of physical meetings, we had a lot of uh, online meetings, and we had a lot of meetings where we dropped all kinds of issues with which we wanted to tackle. This uh, this imaginary box I was standing with, and there was topics dropped in and pushed out because that wasn't ready for the, for now or just just didn't work. And by by making that area work, that that really took 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 some time. But that was the effort. Exactly. Yes. And I just uh, want to point out that uh, Monica has uh, dropped off from our screen, but has now joined uh, Thomas back again. And because you guys are sitting in the room, you're still following the discussion. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you've heard everything that was uh, yeah. said. Yeah, really meeting the limits of digital technology now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think we all vaccinated over here. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people can relate to uh, problems with uh, uh, online meetings. Uh, so yeah. that's uh, totally understandable. Um, uh, uh, I wanted to, let's, yes. we, let me just add one more point. Please. I what is also important, I think Bas uh, uh, mentioned it, is uh, that we um, we are also using third parties to, uh, in our collaboration. So we are we are having the uh, uh, we are having a PMO with Deloitte, and we are also using, for example, with the Electric City Drive, we had the university, the Erasmus University, also working on the project. So I think having a neutral institution to look over the cooperation also helps. Uh, to facilitate some some uh, interactions. That's uh, one other thing we always look, also in the other cities, we always look to the universities to uh, support our research in the cities. Exactly. Uh, let's say there are some people that are uh, watching this, following uh, this discussion. They might think this is something that could be interesting for their city. Is there any advice that you can give? What have you learned over the past uh, three years? Uh, that perhaps is useful for other cities to apply. Let me ask that to Bas uh, maybe first. Well, I, I guess uh, don't focus that much on the MOU. It's the process to to hmm. get to this to get to this MOU. That's the most important part because that's where you, where you learn each other. That's where you uh, uh, build this kind of trust, this this collaboration, this this team. Hmm. That's the really most important place. If you do it too quick, it will it will drop out because you you will go too fast. If you go too slow, definitely parties yeah. will run out of each other as well. So finding the right pace from both parties, and that's that's sometimes very difficult. Is sometimes BMW Group was running much faster than we could, could, could do from city side. Another time it was it was in reverse. So finding this pace and this this almost like a dance uh, you're doing. That's 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 really important. And then the MOU is the final piece where you you, you write down what what you what you've achieved so far. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think um, that's one of the the, the main uh, issue advices I want to give, uh, as well as really find some uh, some content where you can work with. An MOU is nothing but content, so please do also add content for this uh, with this MOU. This exactly. Yeah. Uh, Monica, anything uh, you'd like to add to that? Any advice for people in other cities? I think Stephanie wanted to add something. I think there's an important aspect and it goes with gamification as well. It's the lust and the interest to innovate. Yeah. Um, for the sake of the of um, of the people living in the city, but also for the sake of being better able to predict the future. And I think there is a great um, um, aspect in that to be able to shape things that will be maybe big in the future. And I think this could be an, an aspect as well, like dare to innovate and um, uh, also to dream a little bit because that what you think might become the standard in the future. I think that gives great pleasure to all participants. 
Exactly, exactly. I think that's always great advice to, to sort of think bigger, dream to see what's possible, because I think we are living in a time of substantial change and we need essentially uh, people, parties, companies to think differently, to think bigger. So I think, I think that sounds like a that. great environment in the city as well, because a lot of things uh, um, the, the Netherlands are front runners. Yeah. Not this aspect of electromobility, mobility solutions, and also digitalization. So I think it's a great place to have done that. I'm very exactly. happy. Have been part of it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, we're going to take a look into the future. We have, uh, it's been referred to a couple of times, as sort of a vision picture uh, where we can look at what Rotterdam looks like when it comes to mobility in 2030. So in about nine years from now. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we have a couple of questions for you, the people in the audience that are joining us. And we have a couple of poll questions. We would just like to get your opinion on these questions. So we're going to make them visible in the poll tab on the right side of your screen. Uh, please take a, a few seconds to answer them. Uh, we can go over the question. The first one is, how do you travel to work? The second question is that cars need to be able to drive and park in the city center. Do you absolutely agree with that, disagree with that, or perhaps somewhere in between? The third question is, when do you expect your fleet of city-owned vehicles to be fully emission-free? And finally, the fourth question is, is your city prepared to use digital instruments for traffic management, apps, mass platforms, and data collection? All right, take a few seconds to give your answers in these polls. Then we're going to see what the results are, and then... Uh, we're going to take a look into the future. All right. I think people have had enough time to answer the poll questions. Um, let's show the results. Um, and that means that we can actually Can somebody show the results of the polls? Oh, there we go. Um, for the first question, how do you travel to work? Um, we have 40% of people saying that they travel to work by bike. 26.7% or 29.4% uses public transportation and 29.4% uh, uses a car. 0% of people are using a uh, scooter. The second one, cars need to be able to drive and park in the city center. We have um, um, uh, people saying yes, 61% uh, uh, is saying yes, but less than today. So yes, there should be an ability to park, but it should be less than today, so less parking spaces. 11% um, is saying absolutely yes, and uh, 27, almost 30% is saying no, definitely not. There does not need to be parking spaces in cities. The third poll, when do you expect your fleet of city-owned vehicles to be fully emission-free? We have within four years as the leading answer with 38.9% of the votes. Actually, 38.9% uh, also goes to within nine years, so apparently it's a time frame of four to nine years for when the, the uh, fleet of city-owned vehicles will be emission-free. Fourthly, the last poll, is your city prepared to use digital instruments? And uh, we have, yes, absolutely, is getting 50% of the vote and the other 50% is going. We have started, but there is some way to go. Uh, no one is saying not at all. So in that sense, um, uh, people are definitely using digital instruments for traffic management in some way, shape or form. Uh, anybody surprised by any of the results uh, that we've just seen in one of the polls? Martin, are you surprised? Not really, uh, not really surprised. Uh, I just uh, would uh, like to point out that uh, people who are driving to work by car are definitely uh, the people who will need a place to go uh, in the city, but it might not be the city center. So I think that's uh, what we were talking about uh, earlier as well, is to find out what are the areas where people still will need to drive also in the future and which are areas where we might be able to uh, reduce uh, the traffic and reduce parking spaces. And I think that goes along nicely with what the city wants because then you have uh, an area where you can uh, add bike lanes, you can add uh, spaces for people uh, to live. We will see that in the vision picture as well. Um, and then people who, who still drive, have, drive to work, or there are some people, elderly people, for example, who can't uh, cycle very well, uh, they still uh, uh, can use the car. 
Yeah. Martin, are you surprised by any of the results? Uh, no, not so much. So uh, I think that's uh, it's a good direction. I, I'm a little bit um, uh, surprised about uh, question three because uh, everybody sees it. It will be uh, emission free within nine years. And uh, well, I definitely hope that. Hopefully you don't get me wrong. But um, then we need to do a lot also on the national level. Uh, uh, for example, the politicians has to make a statement and to make it clear that this is a goal for whole the Netherlands, even Europe. So uh, I think that's that's. But let's say uh, it's good to work with op optimistic people. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's better to be too optimistic than too pessimistic. I think that's always in life a good advice. Uh, Stephanie, uh, I, I guess you are happy with the fact that a lot of people are uh, at least uh, for uh, some parking spaces in cities. I think that's something that probably gives you some encouragement, right? Well, I was more thinking about the bike share, actually, because I guess, um, well, living in the Netherlands, um, you get used to having a massive bike track with traffic in the city, then I think it's fine. So I was actually more occupied with that. Okay, yeah, wonderful. Okay, uh, uh, let's see if we uh, sort of can move on to the vision picture because we're going to incorporate some of these things as, as some of the speakers just alluded to, to what this means for the future, what this means for 2030. Um, uh, we're going to show you a picture and I think it's interesting because it gives you an overview of what Rotterdam could look like in 2030 when it comes to mobility. And um, uh, Monica, Martin, uh, perhaps you can, uh, either one of you can, can, can answer this for me. What exactly are we looking at? What, we're seeing this. Uh, what are we currently seeing here on our screens? So maybe I can start because we are uh, at BMW, we've been doing these vision pictures for all the cities that we have a, a collaboration with. But I think the Rotterdam picture has a, the most interesting uh, topics on it. So I think uh, every time I look at it, I uh, find more things uh, on it, even though uh, we designed it ourselves. Uh, so um, what we did is uh, we took a couple of uh, topics that are uh, where, there we, where we think that uh, the city could develop. Uh, we'll uh, talk about some of these topics in more detail later yeah. and just put them all in one picture so you could see what do changes uh, effect in the in the uh, in the outline of a city so what could the city actually actually look like yeah exactly uh, uh, martin uh, it, this has been uh, drawn up by uh, bmw how do you guys look at this from the from the city perspective well this is very progressive it's great because there are, i don't see any cars, uh, streets for cars you, uh, for example, you see this red carpet, but it's for bicycles. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a car, so that means that uh, the car is, is a is a guest. So that's very interesting. I think uh, there are I some cars that, in the background there. There is a street uh, yeah. which, uh, is towards the back. So yeah, like I said, it, uh, and I think that's also one of the things you see in the polls is that the car will still be part of a mobility in the city, but it don't have to get so much space as it is today. And I think. This picture is a, uh, yeah, you could say a provocation to sit also challenge us as a city, yeah, because we are, uh, we advise our council and we say we have to go this way because this is the new future. Um, so I think this is very, and it's very great that a, a, a company like BMW is, is, is trying to, is, has, has the guts to, to, to make a drawing where the car is not. Uh, the main issue. I think that's great. And I, when I look at this picture, you always see, you ever, see people everywhere. And I think that is very great uh, in, in this uh, uh, picture. That this is a city you want to live in, you want to work in, you want to visit, you want to you you want to be there. So that's that's. I, re, I think that's good. Yeah, exactly. And for the people who are not familiar with Rotterdam, we see some of the landmarks that are part of the city. The harbor is on the right side. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. On the, the left, we see uh, The Hague, which you can see on a clear day from Rotterdam. It's all pretty close to each other in the Netherlands. It's a rather small country, uh, but it's based on what the city of Rotterdam looks like, except uh, it's uh, um, translated to how it's going to look in 2030. Uh, take, let's take, take a look at... Add, add a little bit to this, because yes. I think this is really important to, to mention right now is this, this is about the collaboration and this is uh, the, the reason. Uh, well, we didn't give any input to this to to to, to the BMW group to 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 realize and to design this this picture. 
and by uh, when we saw the picture for the first time, it was uh, actually it was live on a big screen at the the, the, the BMW Nellens uh, office in uh, in Rijswijk. And uh, every time you look at the picture, and you go, you can it was presented very large, as so you can walk all the way through this picture. Definitely saw something new. And what what the main conclusion was so close to our uh, policies as well. So so you see in our so you see parties working together are uh, having also influences on each other to, to build and gain something new. Yeah. That's, that's, I guess, something very important to mention as well. That's, that's, yeah. that's why these kind of collaborations could, can be very useful. Exactly. Uh, let's uh, zoom in on some of the things that we're looking at, uh, because uh, uh, that is probably useful. Uh, shared spaces. Um, this is a part of the picture that we're seeing. Uh, Monica, uh, we're seeing a tram, we're seeing a car, we're seeing people on a bicycle, we're probably seeing people walk on the sidewalk. Um, uh, can you explain to us this concept of shared spaces? Yes, um, shared spaces means that we don't have dedicated lanes, I mean, other than the bike lanes, uh, maybe, but we uh, all the uh, transportation modes share uh, a space. And they, uh, that means that you can have uh, cars, you can have, uh, you can have bikes, you can have a tram, uh, but you don't, uh, uh, it's not, um, it's more efficient uh, to have them all share the same road, for example. So the cars might even use the lane where the tram is going. Uh, this can be done with uh, traffic management. We'll come to that a little bit later. Um, but that uh, we just want to make uh, the concepts that we are presenting here are trying to make traffic more efficient. Uh, that means that we have more space to allocate to various uh, things, and that's uh, what's what that's what is presented here. And I find it funny you will see it in a moment because what we've been doing is we zoom in on the picture and then we show where we already have implemented some things in Rotterdam. And when we see the real picture, we we sent out the photographer, but we didn't he didn't know the picture. Um, uh, but he actually captured, captured exactly this, uh, this same thing. So Rotterdam is pretty close to this at the moment. Maybe if you click, uh, Claudia, that we can see the picture. There we go. That's the actual, uh, uh picture where, what it is like in Rotterdam today. The, uh, Martin, maybe you can say something about this. Uh, thank, uh, of course, Monica. Uh, this is the new boulevard of a uh, main boulevard called Single. Uh, we just uh, in front of the city hall, which just opened uh, uh, this year. Uh, and what it's you completely see redesigned. The, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, not completely redesigned because the tram, uh, what you're seeing, is still in the same spot. So the tracks didn't change. There was a big discussion because then, then for example, this this cost the the whole redesign cost about. 70 million uh, uh, euro, I, I think. Uh, so we cannot do every boulevard. Uh, so if we change the tracks of the tram, which was the discussion, then it would be uh, well, 170, maybe 100, 150. It's very expensive. Uh, so you have to do it good. If you And what you see here, the main issue is, and that's you see on the, on the right side, that's, that used to be lanes for cars. And now is lanes for uh, cyclists uh, and uh, especially the yellow and the other hand, the part of that is for pedestrians. So we reduced uh, the speed uh, of the cars uh, and the lanes of the cars in the, 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 the main boulevard. Maybe it should be a little bit more greener, but that's something uh, we can, uh, well, still work on. We can still, there's still room for improvement. <laughs> All right, that's good. So share it. Always, space. always. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like like like, like I was, uh, I'd like to mention something about shared spaces, uh, uh, because I think that is it's a very good concept, um, and that means that we should reduce all the there you can walk, there you can park, there you can bike, there you can, and in several streets it's possible, but sometimes on like for example on the toll single it's not always possible because the trams there are a lot of them, and if you add cars to that track. Uh, the, the the public transportation company is going to be crazy and they uh, and they're going to be angry and maybe they should be maybe they shouldn't be but th there is something that that and this and the same uh, is is about the, the the tracks for the cyclists if it's so crowded with cyclists which, which it will be with also scooters that is the then you should really think is a car then uh, be part of it 
Um, so I think uh, on several streets you can do it, but on some, some streets you, you, you shouldn't do it. Yeah. And I think it's also a very important discussion and that uh, and now nowadays you see in the, 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 in the, the, the cities, there is a discussion, should we drive 50 kilometers an hour or should we go to 30 kilometers an hour uh, to reduce the speed because the road safety net is very important. And I think that is one also, that is a very good discussion for shared space, reduce the speed of the car. So that's what I would like to, to add to this. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, that's actually a very interesting uh, insight, absolutely, yeah. Uh, let's go to the next uh, picture, because the next uh, part we want to zoom into is the part where uh, we see a couple of uh, cars uh, charging. Uh, obviously, that's an important issue in a city where people are driving electrically. Uh, there are some challenges there as well. I would imagine, Monica, that the main challenge is making sure that there are enough charging poles. Yes, definitely. We did. A, uh, we looked at all the uh, countries in Europe, and there are still still countries. Uh, I don't know if you know how many uh, charging poles are in the city of uh, Moscow. Um, I would not. Uh, no, I, I would have no idea. Forty. Forty. 40? Yes, forty in the whole city. So. Uh, uh, there are cities that still have some way to go. Obviously, that's not the uh, case in Rotterdam. There's a lot of uh, charging poles. Um, but <clears throat> I think a lot of cities are having this uh, challenge of uh, installing new infrastructure. Um, and we, BMW side, we are also looking at charging data to also find out where people are charging, which charging poles are used, where we can help the city with, uh, with this data. Um, but what we also found out is that the, one of the main challenges is not actually having enough poles, but people who are uh, driving to the pole, plugging in, and then never moving their car again. So you actually have enough poles, uh, but uh, people are not moving. So this is why within the MOU, we are doing something called a park and charge. Uh, and maybe a bus or Martin can uh, can speak to that. Uh, if you click on it, you can see the, the actual... Uh, an actual vehicle from this car. Exactly, exactly. So here we see it. Yes, there's, there's by the way, a, a beautiful Dutch word for people who are uh, charging their cars, which do not need to be charged anymore, Laadbouwklevers. Uh, but that is obviously, I'm not asking you as Germans to repeat that because you're not going to be able to pronounce it. Uh, but I think it's a beautiful word. <laughs> um, uh, 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 Bas and, and Martin, uh, the question to you guys is, uh, what is your vision on this? How do you solve this? Because Rotterdam does have a pretty dense network when it comes to actually having uh, charging poles. You, you want to add to, you want to start, Bas? Oh no! Just just to start, Martin. It's uh, then I'll take over. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, yes. Uh, well, we have a, a policy. I think it's now more than five or six years, or even longer, that if you buy an electric car, the city will give you in the streets uh, a charging pole, and uh, that's I think that's very good to stimulate it. Uh, but at, we're at a, a set. Um, how do you say a several level now because. Um, I, I agree with with the fact that there should be charging poles, park and charge in the public space. But the question is, uh, uh, should we do every uh, a charging pole in the public space, or are we, is the main of the charging will be inside of buildings? And I think in the garage garages we have so many public garages in Rotterdam, so many private garages. So I think the the change will be. And I know there is a discussion about safety nets. Uh, recently, it was. So I think uh, the main goal should not be. Uh, I think that will be a big discussion. Um, uh, should it be always in the public space, or should it be more buildings and public space sometimes? So maybe you can uh, uh, add uh, something about that, uh, boss. Well, actually, uh, we do have. Uh, actually, I uh, just just check the number of poles we have right now, about 3,000 in, in, in Rotterdam, and uh, we're focusing to develop it in a, in a couple of years up until 10,000 uh, charging poles. And uh, then you, you can have a starting this discussion, how many uh, charging poles do you need in the city? Because in every spot where a charging pole is, you cannot park with a fossil car. So with every adding a new car, to, with a parking space with a charging pole, you get rid of a fossil car. So there's there's this 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 mutual uh, 
um, uh, relationship between these these two kinds. So how many electric cars do we have in, in, in instead of uh, how many fossil cars do we still have in what's the vision? How can we push act actively or not? That's a very big question we have as a city. Uh, but by having yeah. this this pilot park and charge, we we hoping again with uh, with gaming and uh, incentivization, see and, and most of all gamification to see if we can um, challenge people who have parked the car and uh, it's fully charged within two hours and uh, they're they're working eight hours a day in, in the office. Go to the car after two hours and, and park the car somewhere else so another car can take their spot and that's that really something I'm very curious about what the results will be from this pilot because if we manage to influence the behavior of the of the of the car driver it will be a huge solution for the yeah. for the chances we're now we're now having so I'm I'm really hoping for very positive answers to this to this pilot. Yeah, uh, the, the sound was uh, breaking up a little bit for some reason. Okay. It's uh, not your fault, but I think we got the gist of it. And you can use gamification to get people to move their cars, essentially, when uh, they are fully charged. And I think that is a, a very interesting uh, idea. Um, let, let's go on to the next uh, slide, because uh, to make sure that we have uh, uh, the ability to charge cars, we obviously need energy. Victor, just when, uh, Thomas wanted to make one yeah, point. Yeah, just a, a sure. brief point. I mean, this is really fundamental. If you look at the figures, two-thirds or even more than that of the entire European public charging infrastructure is in France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Hmm. And in these places, we sell the vast majority of our electric vehicles. Uh, so we are talking here about uh, the decisive factor on the demand side of the electrification. Uh, and uh, exactly calibrating that uh, at the high levels that we achieved in the Netherlands already is the next challenge. Beyond just putting out as many chargers as we can, it is yeah. about spending public money right and optimizing the use case uh, for the customers at the same time. And uh, this is why this initiative is also so important from our point of view. And also regarding the gamification, it worked in the in the e drive zones, but it works also here because you gain points um, if you have um, if you behave properly, you gain points. And I think that's um, far better than um, than getting a punishment. Again, exactly. And it works. Yeah. 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 So essentially, yeah, exactly. So it, it sort of expands on the system that you talked about earlier. If exactly. you have enough points, you can get a discount where you can get certain um, uh, benefits, essentially. Uh, so that is a motivation for people to move their cars if they are fully charged. Exactly. Yeah. It's the uh, beyond pressure, you get a benefit from behaving properly, which mm -hmm. is yeah. fine. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I can totally see how that motivates uh, people. Uh, let's take a look at the green energy aspect of this, because, like I said, if, if, if we're going to charge uh, cars, we obviously need um, uh, clean, renewable energy. Um, how does that work? Monica, can you say something about that? Yes, I think one of the main, uh, I mean, uh, if you talk to people about electromobility, they always say, uh, well, where will the energy come from? So our net will, our grid will completely explode. Um, and uh, actually, that's not true. We do have enough energy uh, in the in the grid. The main issue that we're having is that people um, plug in basically at the wrong time. So everybody mm. comes home from work and they plug in at the same time. So uh, and that also is not good for the renewable share of energy because when uh, the Netherlands uh, has a lot of uh, solar power and wind power. Uh, and uh, this is mostly happening during the day. So uh, what we need is a way to store this energy so we can actually use it at the times when a lot of energy is needed. So uh, either you do that with uh, digital uh, um, charging management, but since not everybody has uh, digital charging management implemented, I think um, we are still using uh, storage uh, facilities. And uh, uh, here you can see a, a tiny uh, uh, container. I'm saying tiny because we also have a huge container here in uh, Germany, in Leipzig. We have a battery uh, a factory, so to speak, a battery farm um, that has 700 batteries in it uh, for storing energy. And uh, for the city, uh, we have uh, built a, a small container uh, with car batteries in it. So we are using the used car batteries. They have a second life. Uh, and then uh, we can actually 
use it uh, for quick uh, charging. And you can actually see the real container on the left. This is the one that we uh, built up together. OK, yes. That's and interesting. The I3 batteries. These are I3 batteries, I3 batteries. yes, from the I3. Yeah. yeah. And this, this, this battery yes, container is located at Klein Polderplein uh, right now. That's, that's uh, a hub where our, our own um, uh, mobility park is, 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 is parked. Uh, and it's our field lab, so it's a, a place where we have a lot of tests going on with uh, different kind of uh, wind energy. Um, uh, and what you see right now is in the far end, it's this green, this gold uh, truck that's that's our electric garbage van. And we have a couple of them uh, driving through town uh, in these garbage vans, and they are all in fully electric. And the challenge around, around these electric garbage vans was how do you uh, charge them very quickly because the longer this garbage is on the street, the, the, the less quality you have in the street. So it should, used to be smart charging and fast charging in every way. And that's the choice we have to make for our grid that it wasn't possible to get from the grid directly. So we have to move and find some solutions here. So we're now testing if we can work with uh, energy management and use the vehicle to grid and make it use for other uh, products as well as we have on our uh, plant over there. Exactly. Yeah, I think that the vehicle in the front is also fully electric. And I'm a best in the Netherlands right now. Yeah. I, I, I have a question. Um, is, is this uh, this charging, is this uh, what we want to see in the streets uh, or is this on specific points? Uh, how, how, how do we see this? We put it on the picture because uh, it, th these containers are actually mobile. So we've been using them also for events uh, or we've been talking to cities where they are saying, OK, uh, maybe we have a temporary need of infrastructure, then we can use these mobile containers. Um, these come in all really in all kinds of sizes. If you want to look at the battery uh, uh, farm in Leipzig, um, we can these can be done in really t big and uh, smaller for the urban environment. I think these mobile containers might be helpful. They probably wouldn't be right on the street, uh, but maybe in a, a company that has a fleet where you need fast charging or where you have bigger trucks that need fast charging, these uh, containers can be helpful. Okay. Yeah, be because uh, I think that's going to be one of the, the discussions uh, about the, the amount of space. That all the charging uh, is, is taken in the streets. I know from our landscape architects, there uh, there is a there there going to be a big discussion. But I think that's good. So we have to uh, emerge that. But uh, that's that's going to be also a big point in our streets. There's actually a question uh, that relates to that, uh, Martin, that I can pose to you right now. Uh, Brown and Thornton asked, do you have a policy for putting those charging poles on the footpath or in the road space? Uh, is there a policy for that? Uh, yes, there is a policy for that. Uh, uh, it's about uh, the charging pole are uh, close by to the uh, parking place. So uh, that the, the, normally the parking place is on the pedestrian area. That's correct. It's the problem means, but that that's also the same for as a uh, 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 how do you say uh, a, a board or a sign something like that. So uh, that that's true. Uh, but the, also the policy is uh, that we have uh, uh, charging in uh, garages, uh, public garages, uh, private garages, because if the people that own an electric car that they get, uh, they should uh, do that there. And the third policy is uh, on their own driveway, but not so many people in the city of Rotterdam has their own driveway, because if you got a lot of money in some areas they do, but most of the areas not. So, but that's true, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. That's uh, an answer to that question. Thank you, Brahman, for answering, uh, asking that question. Uh, there are some other questions that I'll get to in a second. Uh, first, let's go to the next slide because we wanna take a look at uh, multi-modality. Um, Monica, let me again start with yeah. you. Um, multi-modality, what do you mean by that? I think it is 
hospitality means that you have a lot of different modes that people can use for traveling. Here, this is just a couple of examples. Uh, you have the metro, you have uh, micro mobility, you have a car, uh, you have bikes, you have uh, in front there is a shared uh, mobility uh, van that people are using. There are electric scooters. Uh, the brown thing is not actually a um, transportation, uh, but that's a UPS guy uh, driving his parcels around. Um, and I think uh, this is very important for us that everybody can select the right mode of transportation because some, uh, for some people uh, the metro might be the best solution, for some people shared mobility, for some people the cars. Um, and there's also the uh, idea of intermodality that means you might drive to a hub uh, and put, park your car there and then change to a different mode of transport uh, for example drive into the city with the metro or with a shared bike for example uh, and we are currently trying out if we can actually uh, incorporate this in the car so if you're driving uh, uh, if you're starting to drive and you put in your navigation i want to go to the city center it will suggest to you, uh, well, maybe you can drive to this park and ride station and there's a, a shared bike reserved for you uh, and that it all goes very seamlessly because our customers and also not only the customers, everybody uh, doesn't want to have a big hassle when they, uh, when, they, uh, when they want to be mobile. But if you look at the picture, we haven't forgotten the uh, iconic Rotterdam water taxi. Yeah, so, the yes. water taxi. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Very good. <laughs> Thank you very much for incorporating that. Uh, this also relates to one of the poll questions because we ask people whether cars need to be able to drive and park in the city center. And uh, most votes, 61% uh, <clears throat> of the votes went to yes, uh, cars need to be able to park in the city center, but it needs to be less than today. And that relates to what you're saying here when it comes to multi-modality. Okay, uh, let's uh, move on because we have one more aspect to cover in this um, uh, 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 vision picture, and that is uh, the aspect well, of traffic I management. I mentioned one thing about the previous picture because I think there's there's something, there are two uh, other topics which can be discussed as well, and I don't know if there's time in it, but I guess we, we should mention them then over here. One of them is, is obviously the, the, the drawing you saw where we as a city are searching for a new kind of mobility hubs where we also incorporate these kinds of uh, diverse diversity of mobility including charging and uh, all kinds of energy performing also for this, this the region where this mobility hub is located on the other hand and i think uh, martin you can elaborate a little bit more about it because i think that's also important in the, uh, what you can say about this uh, picture is the inclusiveness of uh, of the ride and um it's it, it, Mobility should be accessible for everyone. So this is also the, the goal we have as a city that mobility shouldn't be only for the for the for the, the higher rich people where everyone and we do have a certain kind of people in the city who doesn't have that much money. They also should be able to uh, and have access to mobility as well. So so you can do, they can to go to work, they can go to school. And that's something really important has to be as a city is as a important target and this 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 picture of all kind of different parties i think is really at the point uh, where you should make that this is something you have to take be aware of yeah yeah martin do you want to add something about this or i think, oh, I think you're yes you i think you're very right because uh and i really do uh, like the mobility hubs but uh, the inclusive depth is a very important uh, discussion and we have several areas in Rotterdam where not everybody has uh, this, the same amount of money to spend on mobility. So we have to look at that. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Uh, let's uh, indeed go to the traffic uh, management uh, that we're seeing here. Um, uh, Monica, uh, uh, traffic management and electric uh, vehicles, how does that go together? I think uh, traffic, digital traffic management, uh, is is a very important topic. I think uh, we touched on this in the uh, in the poll uh, as well, um, because uh, I think uh, we have now much better opportunities to actually uh, steer traffic than we had some time ago. It used to be that you only the prop, main problem was was never the rules, but always the enforcement. How do I enforce things? Um, and I think with digital 
uh, solutions. It's much easier to implement things that, uh, like Stephanie said uh, previously, that uh, do not ban, but that reward good good behavior, for example, or that steer things in a in a manner that that helps uh, helps traffic. Um, I'm thinking about uh, solving uh, congestion problems. Uh, we we mentioned the e zones already. That's a digital uh, topic. Uh, in Beijing, uh, we are currently looking at a, a reservation topic where we are saying maybe we can um, get rid of the con congestion by actually reserving some time slots uh, for drivers. In Rotterdam, we are using this for uh, traffic safety as well. We are trying to uh, expand the eDrive zone concept into a traffic safety zone. Um, and I think there's also the topic of parking management. How do I uh, steer people towards parking spaces and avoid people driving around looking for an available parking space? There are a lot of topics that can be solved by um, by digital uh, means uh, and and help, uh, especially with the with the space topic that Martin mentioned earlier. The main one of the main topics is how do I how do I allocate the available space? Uh, and I think we can much better steer this with uh, digital traffic management. And already now, our cars can detect free yeah. parking spaces, and that's yeah. the development of a technology that's already in the market. Yeah, like further development. So that's what we're always trying: taking existing technology. Uh, uh, doing pilots and then scaling it back into the car. And I think that's always our goal to actually not just do a pilot and then move out of the city and go to the next study and do the next pilot. I think for us as a car company, it's important to build on technology that we have and then actually use this technology uh, and uh, have it in a... Um, and develop it further. And develop it further. Really implement yes, it. Exactly. 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 Uh, okay, this uh, uh, seems uh, fascinating. You're sort, of, sort of your car is constantly in communication with uh, the broader traffic management uh, systems, and that enables uh, to manage the flow better. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> does any any other uh, any other uh, anybody else want to add to this uh, before we move on to the next thing? Yeah, uh, one point I want to add because there's something we designed our intersections, especially in the Netherlands with a left wing, with a right wing, with all, more, all those lanes. And it's so important that, that's, that I would say in the future that space is useless. Uh, we should give it back to the people. And I think that's very important to have this traffic management. That, uh, that is very important, yes. Yes, exactly. OK, um, uh, we want to show you something else, because uh, Rotterdam was also the city where the Eurovision Song Contest took place uh, <laughs> last month. And uh, there's a video that has been made about how traffic management was uh, done with dancing stoplights and everything else. Uh, Bas, can you sort of take us through, before we're going to uh, see the video, what exactly are we going to see in that video? <laughs> well, uh, as a city, obviously, we wanted as much exposure on the, the Eurovision Song Festival as we could have in this uh, mostly online event. Well, it was a field lab experiment. So we saw there were a couple of people joining the, 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 the live shows. But uh, before the Ahoy, our big event uh, event location where this, this song festival took place, we uh, had the traffic lights for pedestrians and uh, to see what we already can do with, uh, with, with traffic lights, uh, the Department of, of, of Marketing uh, designed something very huge and I guess it's uh, something to be very proud of and to, to open up to be in the words of the Eurovision Song Festival, the, the streets also to, to another kind of traffic management, so you can have a little bit of fun as well. Let's take a look. We currently can't hear it, uh, Claudia. Um, I think you need to turn on your sound. <laughs> Let's see if we can try that again with sound. We're going to do one more attempt. And let's check to see if this time it will work. And if it uh, uh, doesn't, we'll move on to the questions uh, from the audience. We have 
a couple of those. Why is the risk to have movies in this? Uh, it's always yeah. a risk. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a good movie, <laughs> which I'm now <laughs> going to say, which uh, uh, you'll have to trust me on that. All right, we're, we're going to skip the, the movie because it's going to take it's too on, much time. We only have a few minutes as left. Well, in case you want to check it out. <laughs> it's on YouTube as well, if you want to check it out. Yes, how can we find it on YouTube? Uh, I think if you Google, if you uh, look up uh, Eurovision Song Contest traffic light Netherlands uh, Rotterdam, uh, you'll get to it. Exactly, and you'll get to see what Bas was uh, just uh, talking about, and you'll see it actually in action taking place. All right, um, uh, uh, that's the way technology happens. We have a question here from somebody in uh, the audience. <clears throat> and the question that was just asked uh, for somebody was actually related to the vision map. Uh, I'm gathering that it's a question directed at you, Martin. Um, somebody was asking when we were talking about the shared spaces, and you mentioned the fact that uh, uh, cars probably should not drive too fast there. In fact, the maximum speed should probably be lowered. On the coal single, uh, which is what we saw a picture from, how fast can cars drive there? At this moment, they still can drive uh, 50 kilometers an hour. We, we, we discussed when we redesigned this, uh, this, the street, uh, the call signal, that we should reduce the speed to 30 uh, kilometers an hour. Uh, but there is a lot of discussion with the police, with the, the fire department, with the, um, uh, the, the ambulance. Um, and they say, yeah, it's not possible. Uh, and, and that's something that, that, that is a big discussion now for safety in the, in the to get on time by people uh, who need help. So that is, uh, yeah, that, that's going to be a discussion uh, the couple of the next years. And uh, um, yeah, so yeah. That, uh, so to answer to that, I don't, my, my goal is not, uh, or our goal as a department is that we want everywhere is a 30 because, uh, but there are a lot of streets uh, that that's possible to, uh, to have a 30 kilometers an hour. Um, but uh, yeah, not every street is suitable for that. So that that's why we have to discuss that. Um, but at this uh, at this moment, there are, uh, in my opinion, there are too many streets now still uh, 50 kilometers an hour. Exactly, exactly. All right, that is a discussion uh, worth having. Let's get to some of the uh, other questions. Uh, this was a question that was again asked by Bronwyn, who we heard earlier. He asked uh, the, the the previous question as well. Uh, accessibility of the cities is a major thing, uh, especially for car owners. Uh, they think it's incredibly important to have access to the city with their cars. Uh, Stephanie, uh, how do you guys look at this? Because uh, if you are going to reduce the amount of cars, um, then that automatically means it might be harder to get into a city. Uh, you've talked about this in uh, uh, the past. You've talked about how there are benefits to having fewer cars for cars owners, because that means there's also less congestions. How do you look at the point of accessibility? Is that an important thing for BMW? I take it that the answer is yes. Um, okay, do you want me to answer? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, I think there were a lot of concepts mentioned already. So one is multimodality, that you have hubs where you can switch to a different mode of transportation. Um, and, um, and other solutions that we have talked about. Of course, accessibility is really important, but it doesn't mean you have to get everywhere with your car. Maybe some areas that are also, um, in terms of the building, they are, um, building they are too narrow or too crowded, there's other means um, to bring people safely and also in the Netherlands, very important, dryly to the, the, to the place of destination as well. So what it means is that we are open to solutions that benefit um, the people who live in the city and the cars, a part of it in our um, uh, in our view, but we are very open to combine cars with different modes of um, of transportation as well as with different um, types of, um, of, um, of of usage. And if I may add to that, I mean we are asking people in as different places as Shanghai, San Francisco, Berlin, uh, two simple questions: uh, Do you like to drive in a car? Yes or not? And we only asked car drivers. And the second question was, do you actually have to drive a car? So you have four groups of people. And the interesting thing is that one third of the respondents said, I neither need to drive, nor do I actually like to drive. Uh, it's the alternatives that I dislike even more. Uh, and there is another third of people who said, I need to drive and I like to drive. So the question is, 
is there one set of uniformist policy which will work for both of those groups? Presumably not. So it's really about having more differentiated approaches, incentivization of vehicle usage, but also thinking about smarter, let's say, ideas around road pricing, uh, where you could have better alternatives for those who are actually sitting in the car, although they wouldn't like to. And at the same time, making mobility better for those who depend on the car. So it's about striking a balance or striking a deal, if you like, between very different needs uh, of different people. And that's exactly. a conversation, I think, that, that makes a lot of sense and where all of the things that we have been discussing can contribute to. Exactly. And Martin, uh, accessibility is for you guys as a city incredibly important as well. How does that fit into your vision of mobility? Yeah, it completely fits in. I mean, we already have, uh, for example, Park and Ride. Eh? Uh, we, we have uh, the Kranings Zoo, which is a big, uh, on the east part of the city, more than 3,000 parking places. Uh, you can park your car when you come outside and then you take the last uh, 10 minutes uh, or five minutes to the subway. Uh, so we have uh, uh, several places, but they're not very nice places to be. At the evening, it's not very, very good. So, uh, and I think that is what Thomas uh, tried to say: is that we, we, if you, if you want people convinced to uh, not using their car, the alternative should be better, should be very attractive. Uh, that's that's something we have to work on. For example, our highways are in Rotterdam, especially we call that the route is 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 around uh, the the whole city. And if you want to uh, uh, want to go under it with the bicycle, uh, that it's it's not so very uh, nice. So people are more using the car, even our own uh, uh, inhabitants, uh, uh, instead of using for a small uh, um, uh, kilometers for four or five uh, the bicycle. So I think that that the message should be: uh, we don't want to ban the car out of the city, but for uh, still reduce the amount of space. And you should ask for yourself. Do you still want everybody to, to be in the heart of the city with the cars? In other cities, they don't do that. Um, and uh, But you should improve the alternative. And I think that's, 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 that's something we have to work on. Yeah, that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. It's about the combination of things and the catering to the people to arrive at a destination quickly and also safely. Yeah, yeah. I think, and that, that's very important because the central station of Rotterdam if you arrived there 15 years ago or 10 years ago, you should, what a horrible place is this? I want to leave as soon as possible. Now everybody wants to stay. Now everybody said, oh, this is a great place. So that, uh, that's, I mean, that's, that can change the mindset. And yeah. it also means uh, for the mobility hubs, mobility hubs shouldn't be uh, unattractive and you want to go as fast as, as it should be. I won't say central stations because that's the, 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 the cost too much, but it should be places where you say, okay, it's okay, good to be here. So, yeah, uh, we have uh, time for uh, one uh, final. And, and just, just to add one thing, Victor, because yeah. this, this this alternative and searching for these alternative uh, modalities for, for, for transportation in our city, we have, we have a lot of uh, pilots running uh, in different kind of ways, shared, shared scooters, shared bikes, but also we had this, this B host, these small cars which were uh, running through the city uh, last year just to see how people engage to this and to see how people react and respond to this so we're constantly searching and, and piloting to see what kind of realities will work and how we how we uh, can make use of this in the best way. exactly um, we have uh, time for one uh, final question, uh, and that question is for you, uh, Stephanie. Uh, obviously, the world is changing. Sustainability is becoming uh, more and more important. What is BMW's position on sustainability? Well, I will tell you the BMW Netherlands position because, of course, globally, um, we have a position of, um, of respecting the whole value chain and uh, reducing CO2 in the whole value chain for all of our cars. But Dr. Becker can talk better about that. In the Netherlands, we have, um, uh, of course, an office building where we have solar panels. We have 92, um, we have 92 charging stations. Um, we have um, a lot of um, sustainability measures in place. But the true multiplier in a country are our dealers. So um, we had our dealers sign a, um, a commitment um, in Dutch. It's called Erkent Duurzaam Plus, which is um, certified sustainable, so that they all use um, sustainable energy, that they take care of their waste management and training of people. And this is our biggest impact, 52 dealers 
plus 18 uh, for BMW Mini plus 18 motorcycle dealers. So my uh, mission as a um, sales company is to maximize and multiply um, the space and um, um, that we have in a country. And for us um, in the Netherlands, that's our dealers. So we are taking the dealers along with us to really um, make the results or make our efforts tangible for everyone uh, who comes to a BMW premises. And that's not my office building, that's the dealer premises. Exactly. All right, that is uh, all we have uh, time for because it's uh, almost exactly one o'clock. I want to thank all of you guys, all of our speakers for contributing to this uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, just sort of looking into the future, into what 2030 perhaps could look like when it comes to mobility. So thank you to all for sharing your insights. I, I also want to say thank you very much to all the people in the audience. Uh, uh, thank you very much. There was a lively chat going on uh, during all of this. Uh, thank you for participating. We very much appreciate you. Uh, joining us for this session. Uh, I encourage you to check out other sessions, of course, uh, during this uh, conference. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for being here and have a nice day.